Beginning in verse 1, then the Lord said to Moses, now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh for under compulsion he will let them go and under compulsion he will drive them out of his land. And God spoke further to Moses and he said to him, I am the Lord and I appeared to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah, by my name, Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they sojourn. Furthermore, I have heard the groaning of the sons of Israel because the Egyptians are holding them in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Then I'll take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you for a possession." I am the Lord. Father, thank you for just a great time to worship and to, to have our children sing to you and to encourage our hearts. Lord, we love them. They're a joy. There's something awesome about children. And I thank you that you said, except that you become as a child, there's no way to even enter the kingdom of God, Lord. And so it's not about us becoming more intellectual, but somehow, Lord, becoming more humble and so I pray tonight you'd help us to do that. Help us to enjoy your word, listen to your word, and I pray that your spirit would speak right into our hearts. Teach us about yourself. Teach us what you want us to know and increase and encourage our faith. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You can be seated. Well, I want to encourage you to fill in the fill-ins as we go through this. If you're, you've got your outline, I hope. Um, last time we were together, we handled all of chapter 5. That's a lot of material, so I thought I'd slow it down a little bit. And, um, you know, interesting, the last two times we've studied, we've seen that God called Moses to go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. You saw the movie. And, uh, and, and how he said he's going to bring, you know, the Israelites out of Egypt. And, and then God gave him all these kind of encouragements along the way. Remember, he went to his father-in-law, Jethro, he'd been pastoring, uh, pastoring, he'd been pastoring, shepherding his, his father-in-law's sheep for 40 years, and, and he asked him permission to go. He didn't really tell him about the Lord's appearance to him, and seemed to be shy to do that, and uh, how his father-in-law gave him permission to go, and he just kind of, the Lord just started working, kind of opening doors, correcting him where he needed to go. He gets there to Egypt, and he tells the children of Israel, the leaders, uh, what the Lord had appeared to him, and how God cared about them, and the burdens they were under, and the Bible says they believed. They accepted him as God's, you know, messenger, and they worshiped the Lord. It was just kind of start out wonderful until you got to chapter 5. And then it just seemed like everything that was going good started going backwards. And, uh, you know, Moses and Aaron go up to Pharaoh and say, the Lord told, you know, us to tell you to let his people go. And he's going, I don't know, who's the Lord? I've never heard of the Lord. I got lots of gods, but he's not one of them. And get these people back to work. And uh, so all, everything just kind of fell apart. And by the end of chapter 5, the people of Israel are not happy with Moses and Aaron. They, they are starting to really doubt anything about God's involvement. Their, uh, their, their foreman of the uh, people that were working had gotten beaten because the people were not uh, producing enough bricks. Because Pharaoh had said, don't give them straw. Remember our message was called La the last straw. And so this was a problem. And so by the end of the chapter, these taskmasters, or I should say the Israeli foremen, got beat by the Egyptian taskmasters. And so they go to Pharaoh. I don't know if you remember. They went up to Pharaoh and they said, hey, this isn't fair. Your, your supervisors, it's their fault. They're making us try to produce bricks. We don't have straw. And Pharaoh, I think they thought Pharaoh didn't know about it. Like he'd say, oh, you poor guys. I'll report them to the union. And, and no, he, he, he knows all about it. And so that didn't work. Nothing got better. And then he, as they come out from Pharaoh's presence, there's Moses and Aaron. And so they take them to task. And may God do to you, and this is your fault. And, you know, and so here they're trying to obey the Lord, and things just are going backwards. 
And you know, for everyone in this room, there are going to be times when you suffer the consequences of your sin, but there's going to be times when you actually will suffer and you haven't sinned. When you're doing the right thing, when you're trying to share your faith with somebody or you're trying to encourage somebody and they, they take offense for some reason. And just obeying the Lord or being in the center of His will is no protection against persecution or suffering. But tonight I want to talk a little bit from these first eight verses about how God encourages Moses' faith. Because at the end of the last chapter, Moses goes to the Lord and says, What's the, what, this is not working out at all. And so put this down, we see the first uh, way God encourages us and him is through answered prayer. Answered prayer. Now I'm curious, I'm not going to call on you, but if I was to say to you, let's say I'm not a Christian, and I went to you and I said, can you honestly say there was a time you asked God to do something and you are confident, it wasn't just coincidence, God actually answered your prayer? How many of you would be able to answer that and say yes? Okay. I think it's an amazing thing, but uh, the reality is prayer is something that is a distinctive, genuine prayer in the life of a true believer. Do you know when Saul got saved, of course he didn't believe in Jesus, he thought he was dead, and then he found out he was very much alive on the road to Damascus. And when he was converted, he was blinded, and God said, Ananias, I need you to go and pray for him that he might recover his sight. And Ananias says, oh no, we've heard of him, I, he's like a terrorist, I'm not going any, you know, why would I go do touch that guy? And he says, no, go. He says, for he's a chosen vessel of mine. And he said, behold, he prayeth. That's King James. Behold, he's praying. In other words, if you really want to know the evidence that he's one of mine, he's praying. It's one of the distinctives of a true child of God is they have this relationship with the Lord, even though it might be weak in your life and not as developed as you'd like it to be, we begin to have a real relationship with God. His spirit inside of us cries out, Abba, Father, and we start growing in that. And we see this reality that God is going to use, if you will, an answer to prayer in Moses' life. So here, here's the thing is there's this transition between chapter 5 and chapter 6. So let's go back into chapter 5 and look at verse 22. After these Israelis basically call down a curse on Moses, may the Lord look upon you and judge you, that's verse 21. You've made us stink, literally, in Pharaoh's sight. Then Moses returned to the Lord. And he said, oh Lord, so he's praying, why have you brought harm to this people? Why did you ever send me? I mean, I'm coming to help them because you love them supposedly. Ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done harm to this people and you have not delivered your people at all. You know, uh, sometimes people ask about the chapter and verse divisions in the Bible. Um, where they came from. By the way, they're not inspired at all. Um, the verse divisions and many of the chapter divisions were actually a result of the work of a man named Stephen Langton in the 15th century, and also uh, uh, another man uh, named Stephanus, also in the 15th century. And uh, the story goes that he did a lot of the chapter divisions in the Bible to make them more easy to read, especially the Old Testament, Stephanus, while he was on horseback riding between Paris and Lyon in, in France. And the story goes that uh, some of these chapter divisions appear to have been put in just kind of arbitrarily. Some said that the horse stumbled, and he went, oh, okay, there's one right there, and I'm just going to throw a chapter division in there. Now, we don't really know that, but some of the chapter divisions in your Bible, they just don't make sense. This is one of them. Why? Because chapter 6, verse 1 is the answer to the prayer that he prays in chapter 5. It cuts off right in the middle of his transaction with God. And so he's upset with God in verse 23. I've come to do your will. I brought your message and things aren't going good. Then, verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do with Pharaoh. Um, will you jot down Isaiah 65 and verse 24? Isaiah 65, 24, God says this about his people. It will also come to pass, before they call, I will answer. And while they're still speaking, I will hear. God says, I am going to move, this is verse 1, I'm going to move 
Pharaoh from the place that you sense that he's in, a place of resistance to them leaving, to an insistence upon them going. There was no evidence of that yet, but look at the verse again. The Lord said to Moses, now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for under compulsion he will let them go, and under compulsion he won't just let them go. No, he'll drive them out of his land. And you say, well, how? I'm sure Moses is going, that's, that's, that's not happening. There's nothing that's even suggesting that's going to happen. You know, if nothing is impossible for God, then the impossible is nothing for God. There are people in your life, you'd like to see them change, but they don't appear to be. You've been praying for them. You've been witnessing to them. You've been harping on them, maybe, and nothing's going the way that they should. Maybe they're just getting worse. But God can change anybody. He has the power to change anything he wants, anytime he wants. Why are we to pray our Father who art in heaven? Why should we? Jesus told us to, but what's the significance of that? Obviously, everybody knows God, God is in heaven. Why do we want to pray our Father who art in heaven? Anybody? Why, why do you think Jesus told us we should pray like that? To remind us who he is. He is our father, which means he has an affection for us. You're talking to somebody, if you're a child of God, who cares about you. You know, every one of those children up here had some adult or some parent or grandparent or aunt or uncle or somebody that was probably here to watch them. Some of them left afterwards, which is fine. Some of you stayed. I didn't mean I'm stuck now. Sorry. <laughs> but there is something precious about our children to us. And the relationship that we have as children. My grandson said to me tonight before church, where are you going? I said, I'm going to church. Don't go. I said, I, I need to go. Why? Why do you need to go? <laughs> Stay here. And I said, I, I can't. I, I, I want to go to church and I need to go. He can't, he can't understand it. He, he knows one thing. Papa, stay. I almost stayed, you guys. I mean, I'm sorry. I love you, but... Uh, <laughs> I love being around him, and I, he wants to be around me. And when you are praying to God as your father, your first thought ought to be, God, you have a relationship with me. You care about me like a father does a child. But it's not just our father, but our father who, yeah, it's not, his name is Art, like the little boy said, you know. Our father who's in heaven. What's the significance of him being in heaven? Here's what the psalmist says. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. In other words, he sees it all. He's got the aerial, the drone, the, the big satellite view that you and I don't see, first of all. So he knows what's really happening. But he has the power to change anything he wants, anytime he wants. By the way, the side note of that is if he's not changing things yet, it doesn't mean he won't, but there's a good reason for him not. And so we shouldn't be frustrated. Well... He, Moses comes to the Lord, put this down, faith's lifeline is not to ask the audience. Put in the word audience. Children of Israel, those uh, foremen of the workers, they went to Pharaoh. Pharaoh's the boss. Pharaoh's the government. Sometimes when we don't like the way things are, we go to everybody but God. We complain to our friends. Maybe we complain to our husbands or our parents or, or our bosses or the government. And I'm not saying we shouldn't use our freedoms in this land. I believe in that. But interesting, they go to the government and it totally backfires on them. Then they go to their spiritual leaders, in this case Moses and Aaron, and they're absolutely no help at all. And I, I want to suggest to you there's kind of a principle in this. God wants us to learn that there are a lot of people that we shouldn't really be talking to about our problems because they get us nowhere you know the bible says whatever is true honorable right pure lovely excellent worthy of praise think on these things but sometimes when we're just complaining about our life we're just not doing that at all and all we do is spread the wealth of our discouragement you know you remember in peanuts what was that guy called pig pen that character you remember pig pen just he brings his own kind of dirty atmosphere wherever he goes and there are some people that just bring their own just commotion and problem and drama. You've heard me say it a million times. It's still true. Some people are a blessing wherever they go. And others are a blessing whenever they go. 
You don't want to be in that second class. God wants us to learn a principle. And here's the principle. All the king's horses and all the king's men are not the king. He wants us to go to him. So it simply says in verse 22 of the previous chapter, then Moses returned to the Lord. In other words, he goes and he talks to the Lord. Jot down Psalm 142 in the first three verses. Listen to what the psalmist there said. I cry aloud with my voice to the Lord. I make supplication with my voice to the Lord. I pour out my what? What is that word? Complaint. Complaint. Ooh, that's not something. You can complain to God. David said he did. In fact, this psalm is called a maskil. Anybody knows what a maskil is? A maskil is a didactic psalm or song. In this case, it's a prayer. It's, a, it's an instructive. It's to teach us something of how to do something. David says, I pour out my complaint before God. I declare my trouble before him. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, God, you knew my path. In the way where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Well, that's really what Moses is doing. He is actually complaining, right, about how things were working out or not working out. But I want to suggest to you there's probably more faith in Moses' complaint than a lot of people's prayers. You say, well, what do you mean? I think a lot of people aren't really praying. They're worrying on their knees. Oh, God, you know, this is going to happen. And, oh, Lord, let me tell you, this is a mess. It's like God's going, oh, you know. <laughs> Whose angel is in charge of this guy? We're falling down on the job. I mean, we just, no, heaven's not worried. But somehow we don't, we don't even do it. Moses, did. he is complaining. But he's actually complaining, listen to me, because he expects God to fulfill a promise that he made. God had sent him with a promise that he would set the people free. I, I want you to jot down Isaiah 62, verses 6 and 7. This is what the Lord said. On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have appointed watchmen. All day and all night, they'll never keep silent. Then he says this. You who remind the Lord, take no rest for yourselves. Give him, give God no rest. <laughs> until he establishes and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. You hear what God's saying? Tell me what I said I would do. Remind me, not because I forgot, but I want to make sure you're claiming my promises. You're remembering my word. Pray according to my word. I want you to keep telling me because I'm going to answer that prayer. Well, answered prayer is certainly, you might say, one of faith's lifelines when we're struggling. And maybe you've been struggling lately. Quite often when somebody comes to me and says, I just don't feel close to the Lord or I feel my faith is weakened, I want to know about their prayer life. Are you talking to the Lord? Can you imagine if I came to you and said, you know, I just don't feel close to my wife. So what's wrong? I, I don't know. Well, what's going on? With you? I don't know. I haven't talked to her in a couple of years. <laughs> yeah, that might be part of it. <laughs> you laugh. But we neglect our prayer life and we wonder, how, why don't I feel close to God? Well, he's waiting. And there's an old saying, seven days without prayer makes one weak. Or another one, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon their knees. Oh, why is it we have a hard time praying? Even those of us who know how important it is, there's something in our flesh. Our, your flesh is not going to go, you should go pray. Unless it's to show off. No, nope. your flesh is just not going to move that way. When Jesus asked his disciples to pray, now let me ask you, you think if Jesus asked you guys to pray about something, you would? Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Be careful about that one. Jesus took Peter, James, and John up on a mountain, a high mountain, to pray. What did they do when they got there? <laughs> Slept. I could be a disciple of Jesus. <laughs> I think I could fit right in. Or in the garden of Gethsemane. Stay awake with me just an hour. I need you guys to pray. Right? And I'm not making fun of them. I'm just saying that the flesh is weak. Spirit's willing. So here Moses does what nobody had done before thus far about the problem. Talks to the Lord. And God responds. Put this down. Realize God's personality. If you want your faith to be increased, get back to your prayer life. 
but also take some time to think about who God is. The reason I say that is look at verse 2. God spoke further to Moses, besides just answering his prayer that he was going to fulfill his word. And he said to him, four words. You know, it's funny because it really doesn't seem to have anything to do with this problem. But it has everything to do with this problem. I am what? The Lord. I am Jehovah. I am Yahweh. Remember in Exodus 3, God revealed himself to Moses. And, you know, Moses was saying, who shall I say sent me when I go tell them God has appeared to me in a burning bush in the middle of the desert? And the Lord said, tell them I am sent you. He said, tell them I am sent you? God said, that's right, I am that I am. And the word for, in, in the Hebrew language, the being verb, ours is, is, in the Hebrew is haya. That's the word to be. And that is the basis, the essence, the root of Yahweh. I am. I am the existing one. I dwell in eternity. And I am what my people need me to be. Of course, Jesus, we've studied this before, fills in the direct object to the I am seven times in the Gospel of John. And so it's a it's beautiful description of who he is. By the way, look at verse 8, our last verse that we're studying tonight. He said, I will bring you to the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you for a possession. What are the last four words? I am the Lord. Isn't that interesting? It's the bookends of what God has to say to us tonight. See, we want God to change our circumstances or fix something. And to be honest with you, when I want God to fix something in somebody else, you know what he's saying is, I kind of would like to work on you, Bob. I'm praying for my son that something will happen. And God's saying, well, that's fine, but let's work on you. Bob, I am the Lord. And I want you to believe that. I want you to know that. I want you to experience before and whether I change anything in anybody else, I want you to come to know me in a deeper way way. Put this down, discern new facets of God's character. You want your faith to be increased? It's going to involve this. Put in the word facets. Look at verse 2 and 3, and verse 3 is where we are. God said, I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai, God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah, or Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. Now, it's not that the name Jehovah, Yahweh, was never used before Moses. That's not true. But God didn't really explain himself through that name before the time of Moses. What am I saying? When you and I are going through things, God is wanting us to know him better. Whatever our trial is that we're in, it's an opportunity to discover something about who God is. Maybe you have known God as powerful in your life because of something he's done. But he's saying, I want you to discover me as a promise keeper, too. That's certainly true in our text. Maybe you've known God as a helper, but you've never known him as a healer, because you haven't needed to, but you do now. You know he's God, but you've never really known him as your guide. Every aspect of who God is, he wants you to discover in your life, and your trials are opportunities to discover some aspect of the personality of God. Put this down. Recognize God's faithfulness. Look at verse 4. I also, God says, established my covenant with them, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember, that's 400 years in the past. To give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they sojourned. Now, who God is, is revealed dramatically in his names throughout the Bible. By the way, this is interesting. There are 955 different names and titles for God in the Bible. And, and we're not going to go through them all tonight. But let me just ask, do you, do you have a favorite? Do you have one that kind of, you just love a name for Jesus or a name for God? Raise your hand if you, what's your, the name you love? about? What is it? Elroy. Elroy, which has nothing to do with the Jetsons. What does it mean? The God who sees. The God who sees. Somebody else, yeah. Jehovah Nisi, which means the Lord is my banner. Uh, somebody else, a favorite name of God that you 
you, you enjoy hearing people mention or reading the scripture. Somebody, yes, right over there. Jehovah Jireh, which means? The Lord is my provider, or literally the Lord will see to it. Somebody else? Yeah. Yahweh. Yahweh. Okay. Yeah. Hashem, which means? The name. Yeah. In fact, uh, Jews won't pronounce the word Yahweh. They, they substitute when they speak the name of God, either Adonai, which means Lord, Kurios in the New Testament, that's Greek, Hebrew, Adonai, and, or they say Hashem. They'll just say the name, the divine name. That, that, just a Hebrew for just being, everybody knows who we're talking about, the name. Anybody else? You have a, a name? Yes. Abba. Abba, which of course means? You know, it's cool. I remember being in Israel years ago. We were up where some, uh, it was actually on the, the border of, of Israel and Syria. And there was a father and his little son that were at this uh, military bunker. It's a place that you can come visit. And this little guy, he was like my grandson's age or actually younger. I could tell he could barely talk. Uh, but, uh, I mean, I knew he, I knew he was an uh, Orthodox Jew. And uh, uh, this little guy, he could hardly say anything, but he could say that word. Abba, Abba. He kept saying Abba. And that, that's one of the first words a little a, a Jewish child, Israeli child, a Hebrew child learns. Daddy, Dada. And God says, I want you to call me Dada. You know, people were offended about Jesus because of the way that he prayed. They didn't like the way that he prayed because he called God his own father. They didn't mind calling God almost holy father in heaven, but to call him daddy, that ticked people off. Like, who do you think you are? His son? Well, as a matter of fact, yes. <laughs> Any other names that you've thought of that you love about the Lord? Maybe Jesus or a name of God that you like? Somebody else? The names of God help us to understand facets of who he is. And so, uh, a, a couple of verses I want you to jot down. First of all, Psalm 22, the first five verses of that psalm. God is revealed, and what he's revealing himself here to is not just his name, but he's talking about what he has done in the life of other people. In this case, what we call the patriarchs, 400 years before. Moses knew the history of what happened to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, how God had chosen and revealed himself to these men, and how he had blessed them and brought them to the land of Canaan. He knew the history. He, he knew all about that. But here, God is bringing up what he did in somebody else's life in the past to minister to Moses. What's my point? We get to know God by his names that reveal his character, but also by how he's operated in other people's lives in the past, particularly in Scripture. Listen to Psalm 22. By the way, what makes Psalm 22 so famous besides that it's in the Bible? Anybody know why is this passage so important, Eve? When Jesus was on the cross and God judged him, remember darkness came over the land and Jesus cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, what? Well, that's right. He's just quoting Psalm 22, verse 1. He was quoting the Bible when he said that, but he was experiencing it. Uh, I'm one of those people who believes that Psalm 22 is actually the view from the cross. This is Christ's experience, prophetically given to David a thousand years before Christ was born. But it's very interesting to read what David wrote and to think about Christ thinking and feeling this whole psalm. We won't study the whole psalm tonight, but fast, I am recommended to you, highly recommended to you. But he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I have no rest. Yet, and this is where the psalmist turns a corner. God's not answering. I feel uh, you've ab abandoned me. Yet you are holy O oh, you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel, listen to what he says, in you our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried out, and they were delivered. In you they trusted, and were not disappointed. Do you see what's happening? God, I'm praying, I want help. You're not, you're not answering me, but I will remember this. I know the kind of God you are. Why? Because you've revealed yourself in history to be a faithful God. 
And so I can put my faith in you even before I see what you're going to do in my circumstances because I know the kind of God you are. Jot down Romans 15, 4. Paul is in essence talking about the same principle. He says, whatever was written in earlier times, he's referring to the Old Testament, was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. And then put down letter C, not only through answered prayer and discovering God's personality do we have our faith increased, but we need to remember God's promises. Put in the word promises and jot down 2 Peter 1 and verse 4. Peter writes this, for by these, God's uh, character, he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. How many promises are there in the Bible? A lot. There are, someone sat down and counted them, promises, there's a lot of other promises from people to people, but from God, 7,487 promises from Genesis to Revelation. 7,487. If you just wanted to claim some promises every day of the year, you could do 20 a day and cover that in one year. So here's the thing I want you to know, though, and I think you do know this. For each and every problem that you face, that I face, every problem, there's at least one promise that answers that. So I kind of would ask you this, this. What are you facing right now in your life? What pain do you have? What problem do you have? What worry do you have? What fear do you have? What difficulty are you struggling with? And what's the promise that you know already or that you need to know? What's it about? Have you discovered? Have you read? Have you looked for the promise of God related to the circumstance that you're in. There are in our text tonight seven I wills that God speaks. And so I want to just kind of summarize those for us in our text. First of all, in verse 6, put in the word bondage and burdens. God says, I will deliver you from your bondage and your burdens. Verse 6, say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord. And I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm. So the first one is, I will deliver you from your bondage and your burdens. It's interesting, when Jesus went into the synagogue, he stood up to speak and he took the scroll of Isaiah. And one of the things he said is, the, the Spirit of God is upon me. This is quoting from Isaiah. And he said, for he has anointed me to preach the good news. And one of the things he said is, he is sending me to proclaim release to the captives. This is part of the ministry of Jesus Christ in coming to be our Savior. Here's why. Jesus said, he who commits sin is a slave to sin. Let me say that again. He who commits sin is or becomes a slave to sin. Why? Why? Because sin goes from being at first my pleasure to becoming my master. It starts out as my choice and my preference, but soon it becomes my imprisonment. So at first I say, I smoke because I want to. Now I've never understood that. Never heard anybody had a first cigarette and went, man, where's that been all my life? That's delicious. No, I mean, it's usually peer pressure or whatever else. But anyway, I smoke because I want to. But there's a certain point at which you stop saying that if you keep smoking. You then say, I smoke because I, I need to. I, I have to. This is what Jesus meant. He who commits a sin becomes a slave to sin. And yet the person who's addicted says, oh, I can stop drinking anytime I want. I, I can stop smoking. I can stop gambling whenever I want to. And I just say, go ahead, prove it. And most of the time they can't because that's exactly the nature of sin. You started out, it was your choice. It was your pleasure. But it became your imprisonment. And I know people say, well, you Christians, you know, you live such restricted lives. I wouldn't want to be a Christian. You know, can I just tell you something? I, I mean, I don't know about anybody else in here. I drink as much as I want to, whenever I want to, which is none. I'm not restricted by anybody. I'm at liberty. I've been set free. 
But my freedom has been, I don't want to do those things that I used to do that hurt my relationship with the Lord. Put this down. God says, I will redeem you with my supernatural power. I will redeem you with, put in the word supernatural, and it's the verse we just read again. He said, I will deliver you. In verse 6, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. In essence, what God is saying is this. People are going to see my fingerprints all over your salvation. In other words, children of Israel, this is going to be something. Everybody's going to be talking about this for a long, long time. Because I'm going I'm to save you with an outstretched arm. In other words, you're not going to be released from Egypt through diplomatic negotiations. That's not the way this one's going down. But by a raw display of my power. They didn't know how that was going to happen, but God did. I want you to jot down Ephesians 1, verses 18 through 20. Listen to what Paul writes here. He's praying for the church at Ephesus that God would give them revelation and enlightenment. He says this, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of God's calling, what are the riches of the glory of God's inheritance in the saints. And notice this, what is the surpassing greatness of God's dunamis, his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the, the word is energes here, the energy, the working of the iskuas, the strength of God's kratos, might. He, Paul used just about every word the Greek language has to talk about power. And he says, this is what God has done in you. And how, when did he show that power? When he brought it, he brought it about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly places. Very interesting. Please notice this. The creation of the universe took a lot of power, and God did it with a word. But when the Bible describes all the energy and power that God used to make the universe, not just the planet, but the entire universe, it says that it refers to the work of the creation as his finger work, like needlework, you know? Some of you Maybe ladies know how to do that kind of stuff with little tiny crafts. I'm horrible at anything like detail where I just break it. But God did very fine work with his fingers in the creation. Interesting. When God revealed his power, it's not in the creation. It's in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The ultimate power of God was revealed in the resurrection. And here it says he did it with an outstretched arm. The idea is God is bearing his holy arm. In other words, when I raised my son from the dead, I rolled up my sleeve and I flexed. The muscle, the power of God was revealed there. And that is the power that the Bible says God has brought to us. There's a song um, that I just heard this last year. Maybe you've heard it before by Jeremy Camp. And uh, I, really, I really like it. It is um, called The Same Power. Anybody ever heard this song? Here are some of the words. He says, we have hope that his promises are true. In his strength, there is nothing we can't do. Yes, we know there are greater things in store. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave, the same power that commands the dead to wake, lives in us. The same power that moves mountains when he speaks, the same power that can calm a raging sea, lives in us. That's true. That's what the Bible says, that if you're in Christ, not only did God raise his son from the dead and stretch out his arm, if you will, but that same power now lives in you. And God says, I want you to know my, your salvation is going to be a work of my power. Put this down, number three. I will make you know you are my own precious people. Verse seven. This is not just true for the Israel, people of Israel. It's true for you and me. Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. In other words, God doesn't just save us and then leave us. I mean, that would be wonderful if, if that's all he did, but he's, oh no, that's just the start. When I save you, I'm beginning a whole new relationship with you. And here's the truth that comes to me then and to you. He will never bring you in your life after you're saved to anything that he won't bring you through. He never will. He didn't bring you this far to leave you. And so the Lord says, I'm going to have a relationship with you. What does the bride say in the Song of Solomon? I'm my beloved's. 
and my beloved's is mine. You know, in the Old Testament, we read of King Saul talking to Samuel, and he refers to God, the Lord. He's, he calls him the Lord, your God. The Lord, your God. I, I believe in the Lord, but he is the Lord, your God. Samuel, you have a real relationship with him, and maybe you know somebody else that has a real relationship to God, and it's something different than what you have. That's a tragedy. But Saul was honest. The Lord, your God, Samuel. But when Thomas saw the risen Christ, who said, come and touch my wounds that I took for you, Thomas, he said, my Lord and my God. God wants that kind of personal relationship with everybody in this room. And God wants you to know that you're his. I, I, I guess I'll just ask you not to raise your hand but, and not to answer out loud, but do you know if you are? Are you confident you're saved? Because God says, I want you to know. You're going to know that you're saved. You know, you can know that you're saved. Some people go, well, no one really knows. Just kind of die and kind of hope you get there, right? Uh, no, that's not what the Bible teaches. John in 1 John says, I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. You can know. And you go, well, what if you don't know? The Bible says, then make your calling and your election sure. You can confirm it. Well, how do I do that? By surrendering your life to Jesus Christ and asking him to be your Savior. Well, I've done that. The Bible says in Romans 8, if we are his, the Spirit of God lives in us, and his Spirit cries out, David, Abba, Father. He cries out within us. There's a sense. The Bible says God's Spirit bears witness, witness with our spirit that we're children of God. And so there's an internal confirmation. Somebody went to Martin Luther once who was struggling with their faith, and he said, Martin, do you always know that you're saved? He said, yes. He said, well, do you always feel saved? He said, no. He says, what do you mean? He says, you, I just thought you always, you know, you're Martin Luther. Here I stand. He said, you don't always feel saved? He said, no, but he said, I know that I am. He said, what do you mean? He said, well, listen, he took, Martin Luther took a coin, and he said, put this in your pocket. And the man put it in his pocket. And uh, he said, so tell me, where's the coin? And the man said, in my pocket. He said, can you feel it? He said, no. Well, then how do you know it's in your pocket? He said, because I just put it in there. That's exactly right. I don't always feel saved, but I know that I am because God's word tells me that I am. Sometimes I feel it, but I have confidence what God has said is true because he has placed me in Christ. Put this down, number four. God says, I will take you away to a new prepared place. Verse 8, I will bring you to the land which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Summing it up, I'm going to save you from your bondages and your burdens. If you're a Christian, you say, he did that. I am going to save you by my supernatural power. There's going to be evidence of change within you that had to be a work of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to save you to become a people for my own possession. Now a child of God. And I'm going to save you and ultimately take you to a place I've prepared for you. What did Jesus say? I go to, well, prepare a place for you that where I am you may be also. You see, through the cross of Jesus Christ, God broke the power of our bondage to Satan to sin and to self. And he released us from our burdens of guilt, of shame, and condemnation. But through the resurrection power of Jesus Christ, God makes us his, his precious people. Jot down 1 Peter 2, 9. I love this verse. Peter says this, you're a chosen race, you Christians, a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation, a people for God's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know, a lot of times I think people misunderstand the word holy, especially when God says you're holy. I think we feel like, well, no, I'm not, you know. We, we act like God's making a compliment to us. Somebody says, you're, you're, you're holy. No, you are. <laughs> it's not a compliment. It's a statement of fact. The word means to be set apart for God. It has to do with purpose. It doesn't have to do with perfection. When God calls you holy, he's not saying you're flawless, you never sin. He's just saying you're his. 
In fact, that's the simplest way to remember what the word holy is. If you happen to have a book that says Holy Bible, you know the word Bible just means book, don't you? I know for most of us it means a certain book, and it does, but the word Biblos, it's just book. But this isn't just any book. This is his book. This is his word. When we take people to Israel, we say, would you like to go on a tour of the Holy Land? Why? Because it's his land. That's what he says in the Old Testament. I know the Palestinians and the Jews will argue about this forever, whose land it is. But let's be real clear. God says it's mine. And I've given it to them, by the way. Holy means his. So when God says, you're my holy people, he's saying, you're mine. You're mine. I, I love you. And so then on your, on your sheets, just put this down. I wanted to give you something specific regarding these I wills. And that is, put in the word, rekindle and refresh your faith. Let God's perfect I wills rekindle and refresh your faith. Why? Because it's interesting, if you actually go through it, there aren't just four sets of things here. There's actually seven I wills in our text. If you read them, you'll discover that. Seven specific statements. Let, let me just read them to you in case you missed it. I did read the text, but God says, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. That's God's salvation. Then secondly, I will deliver you from their bondage. That's God's liberation. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm. That's God's redemption. I will take you for my people and I will be your God. That's God's adoption. You will know that I am the Lord your God. That's God's revelation. I will bring you to the land of your fathers. That's God's direction in your life. And I will give it to you for a possession. And that's God's provision. Seven I wills of God. Interesting how God's going to encourage Moses' faith, answered prayer, revealing his character through his name and his faithfulness in the past, and then these seven promises. I will, I will, I will, I will. You know what's not in this list? Anywhere where God says, if you. Seven I wills, but not one. Asterisk, maybe, all depends, we'll see. Not one if you. When Paul was about to be beheaded, we studied it in 2 Timothy, for his faith in Jesus Christ by Caesar Nero, he's writing to his protege, Timothy. He could have said anything he wanted to in those final words to Timothy. But he doesn't say, be strong in righteousness or grow in your understanding of theology. That would be fine. Paul's final words to Timothy were, grow in grace. That's just not the starting point, you guys. That's the whole point. God says, I will, I will, I will. I am going to do this in your life. Believe my word. Trust me. No, it hasn't happened yet. Pharaoh hasn't released them. And the children of Israel, well, they don't like you too much today, Moses. That's okay. You're right where I want you to be. And instead of talking to Aaron about it and writing letters to Jethro about it and talking to everybody but me about it, you came to me. And I want to encourage your faith right now. I am the Lord. I am a promise keeper. I'm going to do what I said. I'm not going to tell you everything between now and the day they walk through the Red Sea because there's a lot more coming. But I'm at work in their life to get them ready and I'm at work in your life. Now, if we can just transpose that Take somebody you want to see saved. Is it somebody in your family? Is it somebody you work with? Is it a friend? Is it somebody, a grandchild? And you've been praying, you've been witnessing, and it seems like things aren't going anywhere. How do you know when their Red Sea experience is going to be? They'll we'll say, oh, well, I've been praying for years. And I just don't feel like anything's happening. In fact, I think they like me less. Sounds like par for the course according to the text. What if God's saying, their day is coming. I will be faithful to accomplish in their life. But what I want you to believe tonight is I am the Lord right now. I will keep my promises to you. And it won't be based on how much you deserve it or they deserve it. By the way, God's timing is seldom, well, maybe almost never mind. 
I have recognized this. Maybe you have too. I am always in a hurry, and God never is. And there are times I feel like, it's too late, God. It's too late. Whenever I feel that, you know what I remind myself of? Jesus going to Lazarus' funeral. And the sister said, remember the sisters who had dialed 911? Saying, Jesus, he whom you love is sick. We need you here. <laughs> and Jesus ignored it. And he showed up. And they came and said, you know, we're glad to have you at the funeral. Well, I didn't say that. That's what they thought. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now you tell me, is that like a statement of great faith? Like, I know if you had been here, we wouldn't be having a funeral right now because you have great power. Or was that somehow a statement of, why weren't you here? It's too late. I think that's something Sarah and Abram might have said. Or Zacharias and Elizabeth might have said. Or everyone in this room might be saying, don't sell God short. He can do anything. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Let's have the worship team come. I want you to stand and I want to pray for us. Before we worship, I want us to put before God that person that we're longing to see change that isn't. That circumstance that maybe is getting worse before our eyes. Maybe even an honest confession that we've stopped praying about it ourselves, but we're still talking about it and complaining to everybody but God. Can I encourage you tonight, not because I think it's good to complain to God, but it's better to complain in faith, believing that God's hearing you and that he's going to fulfill his promises. Take your complaint like David instructed us to the Lord and let God respond to you. Let him remind you that he has great and awesome plans. He says, call to me, and I will show you great and mighty things you know not of. But you've got to make the call. You've got to trust him. Say, Lord, your timing, I don't understand it. But I want you to do all in my life that you want to do through this difficulty. Like Habakkuk, God, I don't get why you use the Babylonians to judge your people. They are wicked. We're just a little wicked, but they're really wicked. But if that's what you're going to do, and I can't change it, then help me to express my faith right now. I will praise you because you'll give me hind feet on high places. You won't take the mountain away, but you'll give me the ability to get over it with your help. So I trust you. Renew my faith. Strengthen my faith. Grow my faith. Use me, Lord, so that I'll be a witness for you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's sing to the Lord. On behalf of our pastors and staff, we want to thank you for tuning in to today's video. If you want to stay informed about what's going on here at Calvary Chapel East Anaheim, we'd love for you to subscribe to our channel. Go ahead and do so by clicking the button below. We'll see you next time.